2015 saw arguably the biggest spike in global terrorism. With this came the rise of anti-Muslim attacks. Go back to your country where they're bombing every day. Yeah, good Muslim, innit? Yeah, you, mate. No one knows what you're saying. Nobody knows. Go back to Turkey and talk that Oh no, you can't. It gets blown up in Turkey. As the world welcomes a new year, this cycle of terror attacks and hate crime shows no sign of ending. Maybe the solution lies in revisiting events that have triggered the spike. The police say that they have to accept the potential that this is a racially motivated attack. What makes you think this is an Islamophobic incident? Is the, the graphic or the EDL? EDL? Yes. Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry is now an issue that we cannot ignore. There was one example where she was wearing a headscarf and the person came to her and said, Whenever it involves someone who is Muslim, the first thing in the headline is Muslim. It has become the predominant form of discrimination in Europe today. It is proving to be intoxicating and multi-layered, manifesting itself at media, state and party political level. The Islamophobic rhetoric in the media goes up on two occasions. One is when there's um, domestic trouble. The second occasion is when Britain is at war abroad. They're fighting a foreign enemy and they're often fighting in Muslim lands. It represents a profoundly divisive force, not least because the Muslim question is a central component of the war on terror and the struggle of identifying the root causes of terrorism. Time and time again we've seen that actually it's because of unjust foreign policy, it's because of our country backing dictators in the Muslim world that has led to violence and terrorism, and yet that just isn't discussed. Some people talk about foreign policy. I will concede to anybody that foreign policy is the root cause if they can explain to me what our British foreign policy or the US foreign policy has got to do with taking Yazidi sex slaves, killing Shias, killing other Sunni Muslims. We have seen the consequences. 61% of Britons now believe Islam is incompatible with British culture and 45% of Britons think there are too many Muslims in the UK. I do think we need to end Muslim immigration. Uh, temporarily, I'm not saying forever. Um, I, I do also think we should stop building mosques. Temporarily, not forever. The form of discrimination Islamophobia mostly resembles is anti-Semitism, in that it seeks to other and then victimize a minority group on the basis that their culture and essential beliefs are a fundamental threat to the rest of society. The soldier killed in yesterday's horrific attack right here in Woolwich has been named as 25-year-old drummer Lee Rigby, a member of 2nd Battalion of the Fusiliers. It all started on this street in Woolwich in the middle of the afternoon. This car was driven onto the pavement and into the path of a man believed to be a serving soldier. Two men got out of the car and carried out a savage attack. I'm here at the site where Lee Rigby's tragic death took place. Now events like this and the July 7 bombing and most recently the Paris attack have increased the rise of Islamophobia in the UK. New counter-terrorism laws have been put into place to prevent attacks like this from happening. I'll be speaking to a number of experts to find out how trigger events by extremists are contributing to the rise of Islamophobia in the UK. Jeffrey Arnold, you're... Um a partnership officer with the Tel Mama UK and um, reporting um, anti-Muslim incidents or attacks on Muslims. What, how many incidents are you seeing from, say, day-to-day -day or weekly basis? Um, over the course of the last 12 months, we've had about 700 separate incidents reported to us. Um, we go through a verification process, um, obviously contacting those people to, to find out more about those incidents, and then we, we verify or, or don't verify those incidents. So one side you have is the standard far-right groups. So you've got stuff like EDL, Britain's First, etc. And even there there's a problem because you're starting to see more groups splintering out. When it comes to a low-level situation, we have people on the way back from work being verbally abused. You have um, bricks being thrown through mosques, which happen on a regular basis. We have a situation where there's job discrimination 
institutionalized across the UK. You have a situation where in the media, on a constant basis, you see Muslim sex grooming. What's sex grooming got to do with Islam? It's clearly not a situation which is directly linked in any way. You have a situation where on a regular basis, people talk about Muslims in a derogatory way and it's just socially acceptable. The issue really is that, as you just said, there are large numbers of Muslim people in this country who feel increasingly isolated, increasingly under suspicion, uh, increasingly uh, that they should be taking collective responsibility for things completely out of their control and most of the time don't even happen in this country. There was one example where an individual was on the way home from work and she was wearing a headscarf and the person and the person came to her and said and made that gesture to her and she ended up she was upset she was like what's happening here why is she being targeted and what, what she was really worried about is that nobody else on the train even came to even support her in any way the, this is a real example another friend of mine he was outside a tube station and he was verbally abused by a local person saying i i want you i, I don't want you to behead me and so and they threw a ticket at him these types of incidents are on a low scale are so common but as we said, this is not just low-level crime, it's also led all the way up to major murders. Ukrainian PhD student Pavlo Lapshin, who detectives described as calm, calculated and committed. His victim was Mohammed Salim, an 82-year-old devout Muslim. Lapshin stabbed him as he made his way home from the local mosque. Over the next few months, he plotted and made bombs, which he took to three mosques in the West Midlands. Mohsin Ahmed, an 81-year-old Muslim man, was attacked and later died in August 2015 on his way to a mosque in Rotherham. Two men are to face trial in February this year for the murder of Mohsin Ahmed. Can you give us examples of, 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 of an incident that you, gen, you know, see quite often? Or, or? We had a report that basically um, a uh, Muslim mother who was wearing a niqab was sat at a bus stop in Wembley um, with her two children um, and <clears throat> obviously there was a huge amount of people around because of the football match had just finished um, and three Chelsea football fans verbally abused her, um, swore at her, called her a terrorist and one of them uh, struck her in the face um, several times with, a, with the wooden end of their uh, flag that they'd been using at the football match. So that's an example of a physical assault, it's clearly an, an Islamophobic or anti-Muslim incident because um, they have targeted her because of what she's wearing and they and what what that clothing to them symbolises. Um, and obviously, they've then made reference to to terrorist incidents that again shows you that you know a, Br a British Muslim mother minding her own business sat at a bus stop with her children waiting to go home in in some way by these particular offenders. Um, they feel in some way that she is part of the same group that are committing these terrorist acts. There has been a lot of attacks on Muslims and some people call it Islamophobia, some people give it other names. What do you think is the best name for attacks on Muslims? I have a problem with the word Islamophobia and I'll tell you why. Because I am a Muslim. I choose to be a Muslim. For me, Islam is a set of values, it's a set of ideas, it's a belief system. I can be anything I want to be. In the secular democracies that we live in, which allow us to practice our faith the way that we want to do, no idea should be beyond scrutiny. But no person should be beyond dignity. So what I think is a much better term is anti-Muslim hatred and anti-Muslim attacks. There is no doubt that terror attacks have played a part in the rise of Islamophobia in the UK. Concerns have highlighted the impact of the government's new Counterterrorism Act and measures drawn against non-violent extremism under the new government strategy called PREVENT. Haras Rafiq launched a PREVENT strategy with Ruth Kelly in 2006. However, controversy remains on how it's being used. After the terror attacks on 7-7, PREVENT was introduced. It is a program aimed at stopping more people becoming drawn towards violent extremism and ultimately prevent further attacks from taking place in the UK. What is the difference between PREVENT and counter-extremism? Prevent is a strategy that was developed after the bombings in, seven, uh, in London uh, um, in 2007 and it was a strategy that was designed to ultimately prevent people from being radicalised and joining uh, Islamist, Takfiri, Salafi, Jihadi organisations. 
For the last five years, we've only had half a prevent strategy. And we've only had a strategy that deals with the sharper end, legislation, law and war, um, actually intervening once people have been identified as showing support for Daesh and other groups. What we haven't had is the other half, which was really about building resilience and stopping people even uh, getting attracted and going down the pathways of radicalisation in the first place. What do you think of the prevent strategy in the UK? There is this strategy which is meant to de-radicalise hmm. or, or notice signs of radicalisation. Do you think it's working? The thing about prevent is this. It sees Muslims only through the lens of the war on terror. That's how it treats us. From our families to adults to even our children are seen only through that lens. That, you know, any one day you could pick up the Quran, have a bad day and that's it, your turn. You'll, you'll want to pick up a Kalashnikov or something. It's, it's the way that we're viewed as if any point you can become a terrorist. And that's a problem with prevent, that it, it never looks at the root causes. Time and time again we've seen that actually it's because of unjust foreign policy. It's because of our country backing dictators in the Muslim world that has led to violence and terrorism. And yet that just isn't discussed. And with prevent, what it does is it says, what's wrong with these Muslims? Prevent has become so much more you know, kind of Big Brother style, you know, you see about kind of, you know, um, spying on kids, even at nursery, at universities, professors being told you need to keep an eye out for, you know, extremist Muslims with signs of radicalization, doctors being told to do that, nurses being told to do that. This whole thing has become a strategy that has taken the average Joe, third sector working people, people part of our society and said, we've all got to stop the rise of radical Islam. And now we've seen the government cracking down on university speakers. There is, there is a perspective or an opinion amongst some Muslim groups that this is uh, indiscriminately and overwhelmingly targeting them and that they're the disproportionate victims of it. At the same time, there are probably some speakers who don't belong on a university campus, but the problem with that is where do you draw the line? And we've seen recently uh, the columnist Katie Hopkins uh, invited to speak at a, at a UK university and then that's raised questions. There are many people who have said she preaches a type of extremism and hate speech. So all of a sudden you've gone from a, from a situation where the United Kingdom was known for uh, providing a platform for all types of people to speak, however extreme they were, to uh, perhaps people having invitations revoked. One of the things we have to be very careful of, there is an emerging um, group of what, I, what we call, or what I call the Preventing Prevent Lobby which is actually focusing on victimhood, which is focusing on um, uh, the narratives that you talked about that PREVENT is allegedly focusing on all Muslims. The Preventing PREVENT lobby is the new label that has been attributed to the groups and individuals of various ideological persuasions who oppose the UK's government flagship anti-terrorism PREVENT strategy, which has now become statutory under the recent past Counter-Terrorism and Security Act. I went to visit one of the events to see for myself what issues they had with PREVENT. One of the panellists was Moazem Beg, a former prisoner at the notorious Guantanamo Bay prison and now serving as the director of CAGE. But there is no getting away from the fact that the laws, that the media, that the politicians and so forth feel that it is okay to demonize Muslims. So much so that they are passing so many pieces of anti-terror legislation you can't even keep up. The recent Counter-Terrorism and Security Act that was passed in January 2015 makes, as I said, all, a statutory duty upon the within the public sector to spy on, to report on, to break that sacred relationship between a doctor and his patient, between a teacher and his pupil, between a lecturer and his student. These are sacred institutions that now have become, by force of law, an institution to spy and report on people. This is some of the, um, the types of cases that we've come across, the duplicity and the double standards. And it is important that you who are learning now about the future and trying to get involved in issues that I think are exciting, it's not all doom and gloom. There are people that are waking up to it. You can see, as I said, with the rise of Jeremy Corbyn and, and others that are with him, these people have been campaigning for issues of social justice for a very long time, Shaka Armour and many others. And I think that there is exciting things to happen up ahead. And uh, I'm very thankful that there are people who are no longer allowing the wool to be pulled over their eyes. Thank you.
There has been first criticism recently from even outside the Muslim community. More than 280 academics and NUS members issued a powerful public statement against a prevent strategy. They argued that prevent statutory duty would have a chilling effect on free and open debate and political dissent, adding that it shifts attention away from grievances that drive individuals towards an ideology that legitimizes political violence. We have to realize and accept that we have anywhere in between 700 to 2,000 British Muslims that have gone out to join Daesh. Daesh is an organization that is killing Yazidis, it's killing Shias, it's killing other Muslims who are not the same, other Sunni Muslims who are not the same as them. Would we rather we didn't have a strategy or would we rather have a, to stop our kids from being radicalized in this way or would we rather see a strategy that's evolving and changing? Prevent has made some mistakes, of course it has, but it's evolving and it's changing and on the whole the main thing it was designed to do initially was to prevent attacks here in Britain and it has been successful in doing that. When the Counterterrorism and Security Act passed in February, the wording in the legislation is quite faith neutral. It doesn't talk about Muslims rather than non-Muslims. It talks about all people who are engaged in um, extremism. But what we have to realize is in its implementation, we have a very different situation. I know in local schools where one person may, for example, say something anti-Semitic, and that would be considered to be bullying or, or racism, and it would be dealt with appropriately. But if a Muslim were to do the exact same thing in an anti-Semitic way, they would be considered to be a potential terrorist or extremist. We have the same situation when a physics teacher that I know, he taught, he teaches new, um, uh, physics, and one of the elements was nuclear fission. And every year someone asks him, so how do you build a nuclear bomb? When a Muslim asked that question this year, the teaching assistant was like, should we take this person and refer them to the, the anti-extremism uh, program? That is not fair. Only time will tell whether PREVENT will be a successful strategy. There is a risk that in its implementation, the Muslim community is being singled out. And in that, there is a risk of forming further divisions and creating feelings of being increasingly demonized and discriminated against. The development of an effective counter-terrorism policy begins with a compelling and coherent account of what causes terrorism to exist. An accurate understanding of the factors that gives rise to terrorism is essential to developing a holistic policy response, in which measures are aimed not just at responding to terrorist attacks, but also at preventing terrorist attacks from taking place in the beginning. Many people, especially young people, are being drawn into it. We need to understand why it is proving so attractive. Now, some argue it's because of historic injustices and recent wars, or because of poverty and hardship. This argument, what I would call the grievance justification, must be challenged. What we're fighting in Islamist extremism is an ideology. It's an extreme doctrine. And like any extreme doctrine, it is subversive. All communities need to work together to combat all forms of extremism, um, and the Muslim community in particular has no special duty, but like everyone else, needs to work to combat extremism in its, in, in its midst. And I think that Muslim communities throughout the country have done their bit and are starting to do more. You mentioned Islam and Islamism. Mm -hmm. it, it, can you clarify the difference between the two? Okay, just as there's a difference between social and socialism, there is a difference between Islam and Islamism. Social is the way that we interact, and socialism from the way that we interact with society is a distinct political ideology which is left of center. Islam is a religion, a set of ideas, values, practiced by nearly two billion people around the world in different ways. Islamism is a distinct political ideology that wants two things. The first thing is to set up this utopian Islamist caliphate and impose one particular version of Sharia on all of its people. And the second thing it wants to do is to spread that all the way around the world. For me, it's very, very important that we name the problem and I'm not, I'm not afraid to name the problem so that we can tackle it. We have to recognize there are evidence-based studies on this topic. There are many, many causes of uh, extremism and why people may get drawn into terrorism. So for example, some may choose to engage with this process through a political way. The question is, why do some of those decide not to do it through political means, but through a violent means? And that second area about using violence rather than politics, again, may be due to religious ideology, but it may also be due to many other factors. For example, thinking that the most effective way is through terror. Isa Ali, a journalist, went to Iraq and spoke to ISIS fighters. 
He gave his opinion on why he thinks they joined the terrorist organization. Whilst I was in Iraq earlier this year, I managed to meet with three ISIS detainees or captives. Uh, they ranged from just normal drivers and facilitators who drove car bombs to different locations to uh, cell leaders. ISIS are cash rich. They can go to somebody who has no perspective, uh, no pros prospects, somebody who has no hope of a decent future and tell him, here's a few hundred dollars, do this, do that, put this bomb here, drive this car there. Uh, and as well, a radical ideology which is being pumped out uh, again with Saudi patronage. Just because your country was invaded, it doesn't then mean, well, actually, we're going to go and take Yazidi girls as slaves and we're going to force Christians out of their homes and steal their gold and we're going to massacre thousands of Shias at, at a time um, and even kill all the Sunni tribesmen and, and leaders who don't agree with us. And much of this um, is in a way to try to justify actions which religiously, ethically and morally they can't justify otherwise. Yes, they're horrible. Yes, they're crazy. Yes, they're extremists. But what led to their rise? When did all this stuff start? Extremism did not start at 9-11. It's been happening much longer than that. Look at Sykes Speaker. Look at you know, the fact Muslims have been attacked around the world. That's when extremism started, but it's just not discussed. And so what we find is there's an, there is a disingenuous conversation when it comes to terrorism and extremism. If you want to talk about ISIS, I want to talk about ISIS. You want to talk about 7-7? Let's talk about 7-7. But when we talk about the actual root cause, what what you often find is the government goes, no, don't talk about it, or you're a non-violent extremist, or you're justifying terrorism. And that kind of attitude has meant that any Muslim that speaks out, like me, groups like Cage and others, we're straight away, we're demonised by the government and said, you're the problem, when actually we're part of the solution, not the problem. We as Muslims have to accept our faults and take responsibility for the things that people within our communities are doing and we need to fix this problem. It's easy to play the victim card. It's easy to blame other people when you don't actually understand what the problem is. Some people talk about foreign policy. I will concede to anybody that foreign policy is the root cause. If they can explain to me what our British foreign policy or the US foreign policy has got to do with taking Yazidi sex slaves, killing Shias, killing other Sunni Muslims. We have to understand and recognize that there is a Salafist, Jihadist, Islamist ideology that is taking grievances, whether they're genuine, partial or perceived, and actually creating this otherization and brainwashing our youngsters to believe that they have to focus and join what I call um, the global Islamist Muslim Ummah gang. They have to join this Daesh or uh, Al-Qaeda type organizations or Hizb al-Tahrir or, or Muslim Brotherhood uh, to actually say that the only way that they can belong in, uh, with a sense of identity is to join their gang. Muslims are pluralistic. We do have different views. We do have different interpretations of, of uh, um, uh, Quran and Hadith. We have to accept that. So there's also an element of convenient blaming. Blame the Muslims because we don't want to take responsibility for our role uh, in the rise of these aforementioned groups. And so when people see on the newspaper uh, ISIS set fire to uh, a Jordanian pilot or ISIS set fire to four Iraqi soldiers, it's lost on many people that most of the victims of ISIS are actually Muslims. Uh, they consider the Shia Muslims to be infidels. Uh, they are killing many Eastern Christians. Sufis are also in their targets. Um, and so what tends to happen is people see uh, ISIS as a homogenous group that seem to represent Muslims without realizing that most of the victims are Muslims. And most of the people, if not all of the people fighting, uh, ISIS, say for a few small Christian groups, are Muslims as well. And this is also lost on uh, Western audiences because the media don't portray this to them in a fair way. So they just see this as a, almost as a clash of civilizations. The factors which lead someone to commit acts of terrorism are complex and cannot be reduced to holding a set of values deemed to be radical. There is little evidence to support the view that there is a single cause to terrorism. Accepting this analysis, has significant implications for the development of policies to reduce the risk of terrorism. Contributing factors like the media have been widely accused of fueling the hatred towards Muslims. This feeds into the mentality of those who already have a prejudice towards Muslims. But is there anything to suggest that Islamophobia exists within media outlets? Does Islamophobia exist in the media in your opinion? Yeah, of course it does, <laughs> big time. Roshan Saleh has been a journalist for 17 years. He has worked at Al Jazeera English and Press TV, 
where he is now a documentary filmmaker. He is also the director of Five Pillars, an independent British Muslim news website. You have the print media in this country which is completely out of control. Uh, it's not regulated so it says what it wants, especially the tabloid media which promotes a lot of scaremongering against Muslims, any, any platforms in particular? Do you, do you think one more than well, the other? The Daily Mail, the Star, you know, the Sun, the Murdoch Papers. I mean, they really go for it in a big way. Uh, they cater to kind of right-wing, working-class, maybe white male constituencies, uh, going through a tough time with the austerity agenda and everything. So scapegoating immigrants and people who look different. Uh, but then you have the more sophisticated Islamophobia promoted by the broadsheets, the posh media like the Times, the Telegraph, even the Guardian, which is supposed to be left wing. Uh, they promote, I would argue, a more subtle form of Islamophobia. We've seen since the 7-7 attacks in 2005 uh, a very noticeable shift in the rhetoric by um, many media outlets in this country. Newspapers like The Express and The Sun and the mail, um, and even some supposedly uh, more respectable outlets as well, uh, kind of feeding into a narrative that Muslims in the UK represent a danger to wider society, uh, and that Muslims have had trouble perhaps uh, integrating into, into wider society. In terms of media, you've got some of the coverage. You know, if there's a if it's a Muslim terrorist, then we know their religion. If it's a Muslim grooming gang, you know. Whereas if it's a white Christian person, you never hear about the ethnicity or the religion. Rightly so, because it's irresponsible. But when it comes to Muslims, that's the style that is often taken by mainstream media outlets. I think the Islamophobic rhetoric in the media goes up on two occasions. One is when there's um, domestic trouble, and obviously since 2008, we've had very harsh. Uh, financial crisis and very harsh austerity measures which have hit uh, the working class especially the white working class man who um, is who feels disenfranchised by society and that's the Sun reader that's the you know the, not maybe not the Daily Mail reader but the Daily Star reader uh, and you have the middle classes that have been hit, hit as well so in times of financial crisis they look for a scapegoat and therefore Islamophobic rhetoric becomes more normalized in the media the second occasion is when Britain is at war abroad. They're fighting a foreign enemy, and they're often fighting in Muslim lands. Now they're fighting in Iraq, and they're bombing Iraq and Syria, allegedly trying to take out ISIS, etc. Uh, so it serves their purpose, again, to demonize the other, demonize the extremists who um, support the ISIS narrative. We see such, an, uh, such a massive focus on any crime committed by a Muslim. Their religion is used as, you know, they say that this is the reason why this crime was committed. Not that because that person may have some mental health issues or they're just a bad person. But no, it's Islam that causes it. And that's why there's such a focus, because if you can dehumanize Muslims, it provides more support, more political currency for the illegal wars that our government has raged for God knows how many years. There's also very little in the, t in the way of nuance by those same media outlets and explaining the context uh, of these groups and these, the rise of these groups uh, to their audiences. Uh, mainly, for example, uh, there's a lack of analysis of the ideology of these groups. So, for example, uh, the fact that many of these groups or many of their ideologies is, uh, is rooted in Salafism, which, of course, is, is an ideology which, which uh, is spreading like wildfire around the world, and particularly amongst Muslim communities, thanks in no small part to uh, Saudi patronage and, and funding. I mean, I'm not a, a Salafi, for example, but I think a lot of the media attacks against Salafis, um, I see it as an attack on the whole community. And not always, um, but I, I think the whole extremism issue is very complicated. I think some Muslims... I think we do need to get our own house in order. We do need to get a control over our own extremists and probably need to do more than we're actually doing. Um, but at the same time, I do see Muslims essentially as victims. We can help highlight articles which people report to us and say, this article actually stereotypes all Muslims or, or um, this associates you know, whole groups of people. Or, and the other thing is, not just as it's stereotyping Muslims, but actually it's, it's, um, it's stereotyping a huge amount of diverse Muslim people as, as, one, as, as one homogenous whole. Currently we have investigations going on into high-level uh, high paedophilic abuse by VIP politicians. These men are almost all, if not all, white Christian uh, male people who are uh, 
guilty or have been guilty of abusing young children in their power. And we're not just talking about isolated cases. Uh, we're talking about reported VIP um, paedophile rings. In all of this coverage, you've never had anybody turn around and say, oh, well, this is a representation of Christians or seven Christian men have been arrested. And not just at the top level. When you have white paedophile rings, you don't have them described as Christian men. Yet, when you've had cases like those in Rotherham, where the perpetrators have been overwhelmingly uh, Pakistanis, uh, Pakistani British people from a uh, Muslim background, the media will in immediately hone in on their religion, uh, which has left many in the Muslim community questioning, well, why is that relevant? These men have committed crimes and they should be put on trial, and if they're found guilty, they should be put in prison for a very long time, for a very long time. But yet it's not framed in that way. So, paedophilia, ISIS, uh, you know, all of these things are kind of attributed to the religion rather than perhaps to bad eggs. Of course, there is undoubtedly a rise in Islamophobia in the recent years, and that has come at the same time as media obsession with with Muslims when you have front page stories talking about um, Islam encourages sex grooming or the Quran encourages child sex abuse when you have those in mainstream national newspapers where it is clear that this has an impact from young children where 31 percent of young children believe there are too many Muslims in the UK whether it's to do with job discrimination where study after study has shown that Muslims regardless of ethnic group are less likely to have a job whether it's to do with actual attacks against Muslims which occur on a regular basis whenever it involves someone who is Muslim the first thing in the headline is Muslim when it happens with other faiths um, or other types of crime you don't you know you don't hear um, you know Christian, Christian man, um, you know, Christian MP, MP embroiled in sex scandal. You don't hear it. Um, quite often the race and the faith is not even something that's referenced in the article. Whereas when we're talking about British Muslims, that's the first thing, that's the first thing you see. So actually that representation of, of people feeds into the mentality of, of offenders who have this prejudice. And actually what it does is it reinforces it. Because if every time they open a newspaper, the only time they ever see the word Muslim is attached to um, illegal, illegal immigrants or terrorism or extremism, it's actually maybe quite understandable that those, the, pre the prejudice they have are actually just gonna, be, just gonna grow. But at the same time, there are several good Muslim spokespeople who never make it onto the BBC or Channel 4 or the, the mainstream media. And there's absolutely no excuse for that. And you think that's intentional? That's it, that's gotta be intentional. People as a whole only understand situations through the different media that they receive. And that, whether that's from politicians, whether that's from media organizations, whether that's broadsheets or tabloids or broadcasting, or whether it's through talking to people. And the reality is we have seen a growth in Islamophobia. We have a, seen a growth in the, the negative perceptions of Muslims. And at the same time, we have seen evidence after evidence, story after story, where Muslim and Islam has been directly linked to um, negative ideas. They've said that 90% of stories when it comes to Muslims are negative. 80% of comments which come underneath news articles are negative when it comes to Muslims. These are clear statistics which show demonstrably that Muslims are being targeted. It's clear that the media has played a part in fueling Islamophobia and new guidelines and measures are being put in place to curb this constant targeting. Some may argue that the media has played a part in increasing popularity for right-wing groups. In Europe, across 39 countries, parties in the right are in government in 26 of them. In the UK, for example, the Conservative Party won a majority for the first time in 23 years. As well as the rise of right-wing political parties, far-right groups are also gaining traction. The EDL was founded in 2009 by Tommy Robinson, who subsequently left in 2012. He has continued as an activist against what he calls radical Islam, assisting the German-based Pegida and setting up a British chapter of the organisation. The way we conduct ourselves on many demonstrations with regards to the intake of alcohol by many people and the problems that come from that, if you're going to demonstrate over such serious issues, I'd grown up over the years and realised that to try and demonstrate over those issues, people need to be sober. I fear the response against Muslims because you have to understand that the tables are going to turn. They're, they're already starting to in Europe. 
the swing from left to right is just going on. Every left wing government's getting kicked out. Yeah, that's the event. That's what's eventually going to happen. Marie Le Pen eventually will be the leader in France. Gert Wilders eventually will be the leader in Holland. Now, for ordinary Muslims, that should be a very worrying situation for them. Swedish Democrats across Europe, you're going to see anti-Islam political leaders getting in power. We're quite fortunate in the UK that we it hasn't. The far-right ideology hasn't gained as much traction here in the UK as it has in mainland Europe. But if we look at the way that groups like EDL came to be, there were a group of people from the now prescribed Al-Muhajirun organization that were actually um, shouting offensive remarks, demonstrating and trying to burn poppies like the one I'm wearing right now um, uh, against soldiers in Luton and, tr and spreading this takfiri, salafi, jihadist or uh, uh, theology openly. There were a group of people who decided, led by um, uh, Tommy Robinson and a number of others, to set up the EDL. And they very quickly managed to get traction and they were having sometimes up to about 2,000 people uh, going to their marches. And they were, you know, some of them were throwing uh, things at uh, uh, McDonald's shops and other places and destroying and being vandals and thugs. I think a lot of the debate around Islam in Britain has come about in the last five, six years, since the formation of the EDL. We are here today to tell you quite loud, quite clear, every single Muslim watching this video on YouTube. On 7-7, you got away with killing and maiming British citizens. You got away with it. Next time you think about it, you better understand that we have built a network from one end of this country to the other end. We will not tolerate it, and the Islamic community will feel the full force of the English Defence League if we see any of our citizens killed, maimed or hurt on British soil ever again. So I'm, I stood on stage, because it's the only one thing I ever get pulled up on. So it's, it's Tower Hamlets, and I stood on stage and said, every single Muslim watching this video, listen up, listen loud, listen clear. Yeah? If you kill, maim and murder on the streets of our country again in the way you did on 7-7, you won't get away with it. You'll feel the force, full force of the English Defence League. Yeah? That's what I said. That's the only one, uh, five, six years of giving speeches, I gave over 90 demonstrations, it's the one thing I get pulled up on every time. And, um, and to be honest, I said that in a, in a rally in the troops. I also said that in the sense of, I saw our movement at that time as a pressure movement. I felt it was our job to put pressure on the Muslim community. And that's what our sort of tactic was. I remember a few years ago, I wasn't at Quilliam, and Quilliam at the time facilitated the leaving of Tommy Robinson and Kevin Carroll from the EDL. And overnight, the EDL support base uh, or was diminished. Uh, and they now get about 100 to 200 people maximum at demonstrations. But there is a dangerous now, what's developing, which we're seeing developing, is, is a genuine far right in Britain. Britain EDL weren't far right. There are now far right groups, Northwest Infidels, um, SCA, North East. These, these splinter organisations that unfortunately the English Defence League give birth to, but they are now active. They're growing in number. I watched a demonstration recently in, in, um, in Dover where there was over 400 people at a National Front rally. They haven't managed to muster those numbers together for years, for decades. Now they're getting big numbers again. These, these real far right elements. They're a dangerous element because they do see violence and national socialism. They see violence as an answer. We didn't. We generally didn't. We didn't want that. Should we be worried about these far right groups? Yes, we should. But it's not just British Muslims that should be worried. It should be non-Muslims as well, because these particular groups, when they target a particular set, a group of people based on their faith, are actually um, going against the very um, kind, the, the, the societies that we're trying to build. The only way we're going to defeat them is either to engage with them and actually try to um, take away some of their leadership, try to, st because again, they're led by charismatic recruiters, or as a civil society, Muslims and non Muslims, is that every time they try to show their racist, anti Muslim, uh, and quite often anti Semitic uh, um, uh, views, online or offline, we challenge them. Let's drown out the bigoted views that they actually are trying to push to, uh, throughout our society. After Lee Rigby, we did see a, a large spike in incidents. And, we and the rise of uh, right-wing groups, uh, far right-wing groups, 40%, also increased? Is that uh, yeah, something so, else that we've seen? So what we do when we have incidents reported, we look at whether there's any evidence that 
that perpetrator has links to far right groups. Um, so and particular and it's particularly easy if it's an online incident. If it's someone on Facebook or Twitter, it's fairly easy for us to try and identify who that person was, um, look at whether they are a supporter of, for instance, Britain First or the English Defence League or the BNP, to look at um, the material that they have been placing on their accounts and to look at um, you know whether there are other offensive, racist or Islamophobic um, comments or, or um, material, you and, know, the, and, and, that, and that's true. Certainly um, we see, I, yeah, that's about right. I would say in about 40% of our incidents, there is some link to the far right, either directly through that individual or in what was said in the incident. Or for example, if you have graffiti um, written on a mosque, there are often, for instance, swastikas or BNP or EDL written on it um, that signifies there is either, either that person is in some way part of that group or at least has sympathy and, and, a, and a kind of a, um, feels they have an association to that group. This is all that remains of the Al Rahma Islamic Centre, a burnt out husk that used to serve the Somali community in North London. This incitement of violence against all Muslims in Britain translated into action following the murder of Lee Rigby in Woolwich in May 2013. The EDL stepped up its street activity around England to capitalise on the incident, leading to racist attacks against Muslims and arson and bomb attacks on mosques in Grimsby, Muswell Hill, Walsall and Tipton. I'm off to meet Omar Ali, who's the coordinator of the Somali Brevenese Community Centre. Now, two years ago, this community centre was burnt in, a, uh, in, an, in an attack. And I'm going to speak to him and see why he thinks this might be an Islamophobic incident. The interesting thing about this uh, attack was it happened about two weeks after the, um, the tragic attack on, uh, on Lee Rigby. Uh, and so we're going to speak to um, Omar Ali and see what exactly took place. Early in the morning I receive a call, our building take fire. When I come approach uh, 100 yards from here and uh, police stop me and say, no, we cannot pass here. I say, sorry, we know we cannot pass. We are part of this building. Our building was fired down. And they say, okay, let me go. And when you go in another place, they come, they stop in me, they say, we need to ask you some question. Just with the, when they're asking us questions, they say, come, and uh, some of the wall is there. And uh, in that wall, uh, he showed us graphic was uh, EDL. What is happening before in uh, Lyric, when was killed. And then it's happened, uh, these things. And uh, our center, and uh, it's not only our center happened, before our centre and after our centre, we had a lot of centres was attacked as well and some people was attacked, Muslim people. And what, 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 what did you see? And you said you saw graffiti, what, what, what did you see in the graffiti? Is the, the graffiti was uh, EDL. EDL? Yes. This imaginary backlash every time there's an attack. I had more death threats that week after Lee Rigby got killed than the entire Tell Mama report said the Muslim community had. So it's like, look, we shouldn't, on the same time, we shouldn't, be stoking up the fear, but we shouldn't also be making this whole atmosphere of Muslims are under attack and they're being butchered in the street, because they're not. That's the reality of it, they're not. Well, there was a video the other day of a girl being pushed in front of the train. And she, she missed the front. I, I haven't seen that. Side. Where was that? Here, and do you remember what station it was? What, in England? Yeah. Um, you see, I haven't seen that. And then there was one of them train. What, a Muslim girl? Yeah. Is there a video of that? I think, look, if there was a real backlash, I'd be on your side saying, look, and, and I remember after Lee Rigby's killing, if you go dig up my speech, the first speech I gave after Lee Rigby's killing, I stood on stage and said, there's actually 600 Muslims in the British Army. Yeah? Um, if, you, if you attack a Muslim woman walking down the street, you're an absolute coward. Yeah? There's, there's honour in opposing the things I feel I oppose. Yeah? 
it's cowardice to overstep that mark and target innocent Muslims. That's the first speech I give. I didn't have to give that speech. I give that speech because that's what I believe. I don't think every Muslim's a problem. I don't want every Muslim to leave Britain. I never have said that. Never once have I said that. But I do want to solve the problems. And I make comments even now that I do think we need to end Muslim immigration. Uh, temporarily. I'm not saying forever. Um, I, I do also think we should stop building mosques. Temporarily, not forever. But with regards to ordinary Muslims, I, I still do feel that Islam is fascist. You know I mean, everything that shows me that Islam as, a, as an ideology is fascist. It's very important, as we did with society, as we did with Nick Griffin. Nick Griffin was uh, the leader of the BNP and the BNP was gaining a lot of support. He was invited onto the BBC and it was a risky strategy, but he was invited onto the BBC on Question Time, challenged, debated and exposed and overnight the BNP lost their uh, support base. Generalisation in any form is a disease in society. Now with all these varied views and opinions, all are in agreement that Islamophobia, hate crime, extremism must be curbed out of society. Now how these groups are rooted out of society and the reasons why they commit such acts remains a contentious point. However, some continue to argue that Muslims are constantly playing the victim card in order to gain sympathy or to evoke feelings of compassion. I don't think anyone can talk about victim mentality when that's the reality that many people are facing. Islamophobia has become socially acceptable. It's something that's become the norm in society when it comes to looking at Muslims. It doesn't matter whether that person is Jewish, Muslim, has no faith, um, is wearing a niqab or wearing um, a miniskirt, you know, it, this sort of thing should not be happening in our society and where it does happen, we should be speaking out against it. Muslims are a part of British life and despite any problems which may be perceived within their communities and some of these problems are unique to the Muslim community, but some of these problems take place in all communities. Critics would say why have the Muslims in this instance, why have they not come out and spoken out? Have they failed themselves? I feel that the Muslim community really needs to get organised uh, and until we are organised, we can't really speak with uh, a coherent voice to the wider community. Now I think from the Muslim community perspective, we failed on two things. One is actually dealing with the crazy nut jobs in our, in our community. But B, the bigger thing we failed on is that we have allowed the government and the political elite to set a narrative that says Muslims are to blame. Because they play a blame game and we haven't done enough to counter that and say, well, actually, you're lying because of X, Y and Z. And I think that's where us as a community, we need to really up our game. Our local community, we are together, shoulder to shoulder, Muslim and non-Muslim, multi-faith people, local councils, all we are together, we're standing, they're supporting, even the leaders of the area, of the politician people leader of the council, they are offering us his building barn at home to teach our children and our local uh, communities, they are opening us, the communities like uh, some synagogues, even our Ramadans and our holy prayers, we are doing in the synagogues as well. We are together shoulder to shoulder to the different communities, but it was the people who's done this is trying to divide it, the nation, but mm, becoming positive, the nation, they are united. And the uh, multi-faith, they are united. The politician, they are united. The board position, they are united. They together to be happen, cannot happen again. I wish it cannot happen again. Highlighting hate crime is important because it aims to help shed light and create awareness of the issues surrounding intolerance, bigotry, prejudice and discrimination. Crucially, it is also about helping us better understand what hate crime is, who the victims are and encouraging people to report it. There is no doubt that Muslims, particularly those with a visible Muslim identity, are more vulnerable to anti-Muslim hostility, intimidation abuse and threats of violence. Muslim hate crimes and incidents have significant impacts for the victims whose level of self-esteem and confidence are impacted. Such feelings can lead to a sense of othering and risk damaging community cohesion as victims feel alienated, isolated and that they don't belong. The overwhelming majority in our Muslim communities, just as in our other communities, 
share the same values, respect for the law, freedom of speech and equality of opportunity. These values are the backbone of a pluralist society. But there is a tiny minority which seeks to undermine them. It is imperative that we challenge ideologies of hatred. Take the far right. They are still with us. They have never broken into the political mainstream because the vast majority of the British public reject their ugly message. But we must never be complacent in our steps and efforts to tackle all forms of extremism, be it far right or radical Islamist extremism. An example of national unity is seen in the aftermath of the death of Lee Rigby and the burning of Muswell Hill Community Centre. It is this unity seen after these attacks by the majority of Muslims and non-Muslims that will drive extremism and anti-Muslim bigotry out of civil society, hopefully for good. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Taking Islamic refugees would be suicide. There's a direct connection between that population and the risk of terror. Islam is a political system that is intent on world domination. There are real refugees among the Syrian people fleeing Syria. And they're Christians. Muslims might blow us up, and the Christians are not going to. It'd be in the interest of the Muslim community to say, no, these people are much different than the rest of us. And but that's they, not the message that we're getting. But yeah, they, they just don't do that, they, and they don't come out and denounce it. I'm yet to hear uh, you know, the condemnation from the Muslim community on this.